Hey guys, welcome uh, to the First Talk Podcast. I am Wilson Ortiz. I am here with my good friend, traveler, <laughs> rising influencer, second degree black belt in Kyokushin Karate, uh, jiu-jitsu artist, Muay Thai artist. I mean, the list goes on and on. My good friend, Sir Andy. Um, and we are here to talk a little bit about him, obviously, and his experiences around the world. Um, martial artists, being an immigrant from Vietnam, and a couple other things. So let's just re- get right into it. Um, yeah, just real quick before, yeah, you know, it's such an honor to be here with uh, with Wilson. You know, he's been a, a good friend of mine. Um, recently, um, it's he's like a hidden gem. But once you know him, like you really get to know him. He'll he'll open up, and he'll be like a lifelong friend of him. Once in a while, you find, and uh, it's such an honor to be here in front of this audience. And uh, I hope you know I can share. I'm not here. It's like I'm I'm not I'm not a, some famous celebrity or something. But um, hopefully, you know what I said in this interview could be. Um, uh, constructive and educational to uh, maybe not all of you, but to some of you. That's it. <laughs> yes. Uh, those were very nice words that I don't deserve, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, so uh, let's just start with like from the very beginning, right? Like you're from Vietnam. Right. I don't know Vietnam. Right. But I have dated women from Vietnam. Oh. And they're beautiful. Oh, they are. And uh, they come from beautiful families, too. Right, right. Uh, they love to eat, right. which I personally love, women that love to eat. Um, so tell me a little bit about Vietnam and then how you made it over to the United States and how is your English so good? Well, I don't think my English is that good yet, yeah, <laughs> but I'm learning. Um, but I think Vietnam is a wonderful country, and if... Is right now is the number one um, tourist destination in the world. Actually, Thailand is number one, actually. But Vietnam mm-hmm. is somewhere in top three, top five. And it's so super cheap. And the people are so incredibly friendly. And we don't have a gang problem, per se, you know, compared to a lot of other countries, you know, let's just say in the Caribbean or in uh, in Central America, South um, America, or even the U.S. even. Um, but it's... How do I say that? It has a lot of uniqueness in terms of its culture, in terms of, of what you see in the food, what you see in the language, and what you see in the architecture. It's a mix of Western and Eastern um, architecture influences. So you see all of that in a tiny little country in Southeast Asia called Vietnam. And I was born in the south of Vietnam, which would in the city called Ho Chi Minh City now. Mm. It it was named after the communist leader Ho Chi Minh after 1975, after the Vietnam War. But before that, we called it Saigon. And people still uh, endearingly call it Saigon. Mm-hmm. Um, Gon means the, the cotton tree, like the big cotton tree inside the city. So it's city mm. of cotton tree. Interesting. Yeah, that's what we had before. And it's still very beautiful. Um, man, this is going to sound like I'm bragging, but it's going to be weird. Um, but my dad, I was fortunate enough to born in, in a more fortunate, uh, well-off family per se. My dad was, and still is a business genius. Uh, my mom is extremely supportive, um, um, to my dad and his career and, and, you know, one of his dreams was to send his sons to study abroad, to get a better education. Because, like, you know, you're a very well-educated man. You know education means so much. Um, you know, it, people, even now, I hear people saying, you know, you don't have to go to college and get a good career. That's true. Um, and you don't need to study hard. But here's what my take on it. You know, whatever you do, just do it well. If you're in school, just do it well. Study hard. Um, if you have a job, do it well. Mm. If you run something, do it well. If you have a podcast, do it like him, do it well. Um, commit yourself, dedicate yourself. And my dad saw education as a pathway to to a better life because back then, it's just, let's say 20 years ago, uh, education in Vietnam was still, um, how do you say it? Uh, it's not influenced by other 
countries and cultures and the way they do it. The modern educational way. We, we still did it in a very old school and maybe kind of obsolete way. Mm. So it wasn't that great. And the schools weren't that great. Teachers would beat on students, you know. Corporal punishment was a thing. Um, in college? Not yeah, so much in school. College, in school. Like yeah. anywhere from anywhere from <clears throat> kindergarten to high school. Gotcha. Like, you would see teachers being there, students uh, slapping their kids. It, it just, it's just... a very old school. Very, very old school. My parents grew up like that, but that was back in the oh, 60s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 50s oh, yeah. 60s. No doubt. No doubt. But... Um, I think I told you this before, but there's a saying in Vietnam, you know, if I love you, I give you the whip. The whip. Yeah. Yes. I love you, I give you the whip. My mom really loved me. Yeah. <laughs> my dad loved me a little bit too. <laughs> uh, so he sent all my, my, my brothers to Europe to study, and I, I somehow I always gravitated towards um, the U.S. because I had cable TV. I was watching MTV at the time. I was oh, wow. watching WWE at the time. I was watching Disney Channel at the time. So I was very gravitated towards the U.S. Mm. So lots of uh, American influence. Yes, yes. And you can still see that in Vietnam, in Saigon um, nowadays. Anywhere in the country, you see it. A lot of American influence and um, cultural influence even. Mm. Yeah, and you know, um, I think you were telling me too that the South in Vietnam is more liberal, so yeah. probably a lot of people in the South were more exposed to right, like Western culture and right, and, and outside culture. Yeah, so yeah. so so the South of Vietnam uh, is the metropolis. Think of it as New York, and mm -hmm. the North of Vietnam is where the capital sits. The capital is Hanoi. Mm. And it's a thousand-year-old capital. It's very ancient, very beautiful. Um, but they, with that that lineage comes traditions, and that traditions are ingrained in the people, ingrained in everything that you see in the, in the, the clothes that they wear, in the architecture, the houses they live in, uh, the food that they eat, the way they talk, mm. the way they they carry themselves. It is different. Um, so when you fly two hours from the the north to the south, it's completely different. The yeah. people are just you know they're living life. They wear trendy clothing. They you know I don't even recognize half the clothes they wear most of the time. Um, most of them have uh, uh, American nicknames. You know, like my nickname when I was in Vietnam was Eddie, not Andy. Um, everything, yeah, everything was uh, quite opened up, and. People don't really judge you in Vietnam. It, it, it's very accepting and very liberal. Mm. Uh, yeah. That probably comes with the secularness of yeah. a communist government, like the, yes. the remnants yeah, of yes. a culture that, that went is true. through communism, probably, right? Because yes. there's no religion or there's right. no right. world, you know, right. country religion, I'm assuming. No, there's no main religion because communism is a secular um, is a secular philosophy. And however, the I think the largest um, religious sect in Vietnam is is uh, Buddhism, and and then the no no the, the largest and then the second is uh, Catholicism, mm -hmm. yeah or evangelicals, um, one of those two, Christianity, and Christianity and Buddhism basically. and Buddhism yeah they buy for top spot but the mm -hmm. number one is um, it's uh, Buddhism. However, That's there cool. however there is a religion per se. It's an Eastern religion that you might have not heard of is Taoism. It's from Confucius. Right. I know about it. I've yeah. heard about yeah. it. I've even studied a little bit, but I don't yeah. really know exactly. Is it more like Christianity or is, so, is it, does it follow the Bible? Or? It, no, uh, Confuci Confucianism, I guess, uh, doesn't have a God per se. Mm. Um, it, it's a teaching. It's a way of life. So basically you pay respect to your your king, your rulers, that's number one. You, then you pay respect to the teachers and you pay respect to your parents. Mm. So you always pay respect to them, you venerate them, and, and you look up to them, you worship them. So those are the three main teachings of Confucianism. So that runs in every family in Vietnam, and that runs in every family in China, um, and in Malaysia, in Singapore. Those have um, Chinese influence mm -hmm. and then you see that in some uh, Indonesian families 
Japanese family that kind of run into Korean families as well. So that runs into like loyalties and and family, yes. clo close ties, yes. things like that. Yeah. So so even if you don't practice Taoism necessarily, right. that's still ingrained within. That's still ingrained in the it. culture. And, yes, and when you go to a family uh, uh, household, you would see their pictures of their grandparents, their dead grandparents or their parents. That's being venerated. There's a little altar for those people. Like a shrine. Like a shrine. And they offer fruit, chicken, meat, food, whatever it is. Mm. Um, so that's Taoism. Got it. Yeah. And then maybe next to it, you see a little statue of Buddha somewhere. That's mm. Buddhism. Gotcha. Or they have a cross somewhere on the wall. That's Christianity. So it's interesting because it's like the Vietnamese people are like picking and choosing the things that align yeah culturally but also probably they identify it with personally as well i agree i agree yeah, yeah but Dao do you is... practice any of those or um or does your family uh follow my it? family is kind of semi um atheistic uh my mom and dad they used to take me to buddhist temples uh when they needed to, you know, when they needed a miracle to happen, you know, they take yeah. me to to a temple. Um, but most of the time, it's just we keep the the Taoism. Uh, we venerate our ancestors. We commemorate them on the day of the death. Um, just things like that. So you came to the United States, and then uh, was that because you're you're you wanted to? I'm assuming, but did your dad also kind of influenced you and pushed you to come to America? Yeah, of course. Yeah, my dad he didn't want any of us to be around. Like, not because he hated us, because we just needed to go leave the family, be on our own, and um, just go abroad. Yeah. You know, so one of his dreams to send us abroad. So it's like okay. I'm going, you know, <laughs> and my dad was like, I, I think I told you this before. He's, he's quite strict. Yeah. He, yeah. He's a disciplinarian and he believes in, um, corporal punishment per se. Was a soldier. He was, he, yes, he is an ex soldier, um, yeah. uh, from the Vietnam war. So very strict. <laughs> yeah. Extremely <laughs> strict. Um, yeah, we couldn't do anything. Literally we, we couldn't play game. I had some manga books. They would, tear them up um uh yeah no cards in the house like playing card never in the house no watching soccer uh no watching any of the sports because sports were people were betting on them mm. so it was seen as taboo it was seen as a vice wow so no coffee in the house he doesn't drink coffee he does now but he didn't coffee was seen as a vice as well because uh, people who were, let's just say, who were busy, uh, busy working or something, they would be gathering, you know, congregating at coffee shops. Gotcha. So it was a place of vices. Yeah, they saw vices. he saw it as a vice. Yeah, you know, they would meet at a cafe, they play cards, they they bet, they do their own thing. Wow. Yeah. So so That's none of that growing up. Yeah. No soccer. Yeah. Basically. And and he never encouraged you to get into the military because that sounds like he's basically raising soldiers you know yes but not the military in the in vietnam um because he quit the party in 1981 um mm. yeah um he was done with it he got injured literally you know a bomb was dropped in his camp yeah while he was hanging out on a hammock with his buddies in the middle of the jungle in vietnam the u.s air force dropped a bomb in the camp he saw a flash of light and then he was out. That's it. He woke up 91% disabled. Whoa. 91% disabled. That was like, he was so close to the, the, the edge of death in a way. Right. And he lost an eye, had a ton of shrapnel on his body. And yeah, he, he was bedridden for pretty much two years. And somehow they had, he had met my mom before that. So somehow my mom kind of nursed him back to life. Mm hmm um and i keep telling you and i keep telling my friends and other people that i meet that my dad uh that my dad is a is an incredible man uh he had his 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 things his pitfalls yeah but he's a business genius he can't read because his eye doesn't see really well he has mm -hmm. one eye left yeah and he doesn't see really well with it and growing up, I had to read him newspaper, anything that needs reading, I had to read it to him. Hmm. So, yeah, so that's how I got exposed to uh, reading. 
you know, that's how my love of reading started. And business and contracts, negotiation, anywhere he would go to deal business, I had to go with him. Or some other sons would have to go with him. Yeah. 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 Him out. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's exactly how we learn. You know, like it's like, you know, monkey learn what the monkey do. Or what's it what's the saying? Monkey see, monkey do. Monkey sees, monkey do, you yeah. know, like I see and I, I I just learn. You you were around those situations enough to where like you received a lot of that. So the so how did you end up actually studying to be a lawyer? Oh and why man. did you do that? So that just Is it because of your dad also or no, so my my dad, he he he's never a man of how do I say it? He's never a man of having a job. Mm. He doesn't believe in having a job. Okay. And you wear it anything that you have to work from nine to five, he doesn't believe in. And he doesn't encourage he never encouraged us um into having a job or applying for a job. He always asks us to to learn and start our own businesses. Interesting. So yeah. Total entrepreneur from the always from the uh, beginning. Always. Um, gotcha. So for a long time, uh, my brothers and I, we we never had jobs when we were kids. Mm. Um, so you see, kids, you know, when they're here in the U.S., they're encouraged to get jobs. You know, so like plow the snow you know cut the lawn everything right go out there and trade something uh my dad was never like that my dad was just just focus on his study you know once you've done your study well you can have some seed money you can start your own business so that was his thing he would never encourage us to you know go clean somebody else's house or do something like that yeah um but going to law school was entirely my decision um it just you know I happened to to stumble upon a great history U.S. history teacher um, in high school. Shout out to Mr. Vince. And you know we talk about U.S. history, and then I started reading letters from our you know American fathers, founders per se, and just the way they they wrote, the way you know that the pro which is beautiful. I really read a lot, so. You understand what I'm saying? It's just beautiful the way they wrote, the way they they expressed themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just wanted to learn, you know, how could they put such a difficult, such difficult concept into such simple and straightforward writing? Right. That takes a lot of, lot of brain power and a lot of education. And, you know, I did foresight. And foresight, yeah. Like to know that yeah. that was going to be the structure, the backbone yes. of an entire country. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had long talked about this, you know, at one point. Um, and I, I just saw that there were lawyers. They were all really right. trained, right. educated for a long, long time. So there I went with a love of history, love for American history and um, the law. I went to law school. Man, but it's, it's great. And and you liked, but you liked it. Yeah, yeah, I love law school. Yeah, you liked law school, but <laughs> yeah. did you yeah. end up becoming a, a, a actual full blown lawyer no. in California and doing the whole thing? Or? That I did not. Um, I really enjoyed law school. I don't know if you know what, how law school works. It, have you ever thought about applying to law school? I know some people are like, oh, I thought about applying. No, my mom, my, so my grandma. Is in, an incredible woman. My grandma still alive. Shout out to Virginia. So. <laughs> my my grandma is an incredible woman. Uh, my grandma told my mom and my dad that she could see sense. My grandma always had like a sixth sense about her, where she could. She said my brother was going to be a financier. Mm. And I was probably going to be a lawyer or it's yeah, a lawyer. <laughs> some sort of like uh, in communications, wow. talks, you know, conversations, things like that. And uh, well, she was right. And uh, my brother is right now an investment banker. And I am not a lawyer, but I did go to school uh, and studied history, anthropology, mm. yeah. sociology, psychology, philosophy. Um, communications, yeah. uh, speech. Uh, so I did a lot of that. And at one point I did consider it and I did think about it because uh, I had a, a girlfriend at the time who was 
uh, in law school. Mm. And uh, she and I would, I mean, I would see her study for like hours and hours <laughs> reading stuff that yeah. I, at the beginning I didn't understand. Right. But as I started reading it and learning it with her, I started to see what you saw, mm. which is how beautiful right. the law is written. There's not one word too much. There's right. not one word too right. little. It's just it, it, there's an economy of words yes. used just right to express right. that thought or that right. law right. or that idea. Right. And I found that so amazing that then a lawyer can then take that, interpret it, and then try to have a judge pass judgment on it based on their interpretation. And then you, it's like a battle, you know, between two lawyers interpreting the law just slightly different. And then the judge ultimately makes the decision. I found that so interesting, so amazing, so appealing right. um, that I also fell in love with law through learning it with my ex-girlfriend. And um, but it never I never really thought that that was for me. You know, I right. thought that that going to battle uh, from a legal standpoint just seemed a little boring yeah. and yeah. dreadful yeah. and yeah. kind of exhausting and. And I had friends that were lawyers because of my ex-girlfriend. I met lawyers and stuff. Right. And I just, it didn't seem like something that was, um, uh, you know, something that would fill, fulfill me. Right. Uh, and so I didn't choose that path. But yeah. I did enjoy it a lot. And I think that from what I, from what I learned from learning the law with her and stuff, I think what I got out of it is that I like talking to people. Right. I like history, just like you. I enjoy, you know, um, finding like, like the the crooks and crannies, or what is it, the, whatever, however the saying goes. I like finding like and breaking between the lines right. of things. You right. know, like if you say something, I like trying to understand you fully, right. and completely, right. based on what you're saying. I don't want to assume too much. I will assume a little bit. Right. But I will I'll leave you to interpret yourself the way that you want to interpret yourself. And then I extract a lot of that knowledge from you. And then I enjoy talking to people and getting to know them more yeah, by, by asking good. further questions like that. Yeah, that, yeah, he's perfect for this job. <laughs> yeah, so this is why I decided yeah. to do this, because I think that this is perfect. I, I like getting to know people in general and uh, then extracting a little bit more and then pushing a little bit yeah. more and then back and forth we go. Yeah. You know? um, so you didn't practice... But I, I practice, but I, I, I don't have a license yet. Got I it, never got took it. the bar, yes. Okay. And not because that I uh the the law has done something damaging to me or I hate it or something. It's just um, you know, uh when I graduated law school, you know, other opportunities ar arose, um and business opportunities. So mm. um so I, I try uh following that path for a little and, and you know, hit some successes. Um, so it's just, you know, that's my path now. <laughs> so speaking of that, let's talk about what I really wanted to talk to you about is, um, you are a YouTube influencer and with 40,000 plus subscribers. So he's talking the talk and walking the walk, which I find amazing because it's inspiring and I admire him in that sense. That he just says, I'm going, and he goes, and he films, and he also doesn't like doing touristy things. By the way, check him out at Young and Hungry. No, it's Sir Andy now. Just Sir Andy. Okay, so just Sir Andy on YouTube. Uh, he travels the world. He goes. Um, he doesn't like doing the touristy stuff, although you might see a little bit of touristy stuff here and there. But mostly what he likes doing is getting to know the people, the culture, the food. Um, he likes to also go to like some dark places in some of these countries to maybe, you know, get understand a little bit more about the culture uh, uh, behind the scenes, you know, not typical to what the, the average tourist may go and see in some of these countries. Right. Um, and I admire that completely because I'm from Puerto Rico and that is hard to do there. That is hard to do there. And there's a few instances. He went to Puerto Rico and there were a few instances where he got in to know the people there and got some knowledge about some of the behind the scenes of things that happened there. And you can go check it out right now. The one from Puerto Rico is amazing. 
Um, in fact, I was watching it and I was like, why didn't I do that? You know, I'm from there. Uh-huh. I know how, where to go, how to do it. That That's exactly that. That's the same question that I ask people anywhere I go in the world. You know, like, why don't you just pick up the camera? Mm. Because anything that you think is boring in your life, it's actually interesting to others. Um, even you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, even you're you're just going to a nine to five job. You have something to share. You always have something to share. You are unique as you, um, and the environment around you is unique to you as well. Right. And how you see them is unique to you, and you can present your side of you, and and it's amazing. Um, so I've been to very remote uh, places and. I remember this one guy in an extremely remote uh, mountainous region in Vietnam. It's called Sa- Sapa. So he's high up in there. It's just him, and you got to drive half an hour from the from the main road just to get to his house. And then you got to walk a little way. Uh, but somehow, when I got there, he is a fellow YouTuber. He's a fellow YouTuber. He, you know, the guy didn't even have a toilet, but he's a fellow YouTuber, and he <laughs> shoots on his little tiny little. I don't know, a Chinese uh, phone. And he has around, uh, at the time, he had about 50,000 followers. And he would shoot just daily, everyday thingy. Um, you know, his butchering a pig, his, you know, planting the field, uh, you know, his cooking, you know, but he's cooking with wood and with a stove. You know, it's just different, and people like to see that. Right. So just pick up the camera. <laughs> Yes, that's yeah. actually yeah. one thing that I learned about Andy is that everywhere you go, there is something interesting that you can catch with your yeah. eye that's from your perspective that other people may have seen, but they haven't really seen it. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. it's it's more like uh, sometimes you you talk about something and people have heard that. And and but they haven't really understood it. So when somebody actually presents the information, then somebody's like, "Oh yeah, I've I've kind of intuitively known that, but I've never actually, you know, thought about it that much." And and that's what I like about Andy is that Andy's like, "No, no, no. If you pick up the camera and you go to these places and you present the information from your perspective, you actually might be." opening up or widening people's perspective to that same information that you probably already know about or have intuitively known about. Right. So I find that very yeah. encouraging. Yeah. You know? And even though, like, you don't know, there's a saying that you don't know what you don't know. And it's so true. Um, you just don't know until you do it. Uh, um, if you want to start a podcast, start a podcast. You know, just go do it. You do, do not overthink. You know, do the first, not even the first 10 episodes, not even the first 20. You need to, 50, 100 episodes in, that's when you really learn your style. That's when you figure out who you truly are, you know, but in a genuine way. Don't fake it. You, If you fake it, people will know. Yeah. And, sure. and you know, just put 100 videos in. You know, what is it? Mr. Beast didn't hit a, a million sub or 10,000 sub or something until his 200 video or something. So he, it's crazy. So you're saying that it takes a while to become a master at that thing that you're interested in. I, yeah, but not even at master level. I would say at the basic level, you need to figure out the basic infrastructure, the foundation. And in, in order to learn the found, foundation in, in any social media, in YouTube, in podcasting, you need a few episodes. You know, I would say 50 episodes. You know, that's right. when you really feel comfortable. That's when you lay the foundation that you can stand on and build. So when did you feel comfortable when you were doing YouTube? Because you've already done, right. what, 20 countries or whatever it is? Yeah. Um, when did you start to feel like you were hitting a rhythm and a flow and really, like, right catching fire? So, so I would say the first... So when I started YouTube, you know, I, I jumped my head first. head first into it you know i bought the the best camera uh, you don't have to buy the best camera just start with your phone that you have right now um but i wanted to make this work so i invested a lot of money into it and like how much money are we talking about would you say it was like your initial investment i would say six seven thousand dollars mm. um camera 
camera, you know, the audio, audio we're shooting on is literally 2000 already with tax 2200. Lumix, what is it? Lumix S5. S5. You know, with a with the best of the best microphone is 300 bucks. Mm. Um that and then you need a photography backpack otherwise your gear is going to be ruined. Right. Right. And then when you shoot travel content, you need to travel. So, so so at first, you know, I was shooting a lot of like fancy food, you know, the king crab, lobster, and it would travel to a nice area, and that would cost a lot of money. Uh, now my style is a little bit different. But if you're gonna do it, dedicate yourself to it. Be the best. Not, don't start out trying to be the best, but trying to be the best version of yourself in that time of frame. Like most genuine, yeah. authentic. And then increase. On every video, every podcast you do, do something new. Even if just one thing, do mm -hmm. something new. Change the thumbnail, change up the sound, the lighting, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I always do that, and I still do it now. Every, little little adjustments. Every little thing, you know. One thing bad you take away. One thing good you add to it. Mm -hmm. So that's how you improve. Um, and eventually, people, because I, I started, you know, after twenty videos, I knew I could make good videos. Because I was learning from the best. Um, I was copying the style because I wasn't, I hadn't figured it out yet. You know, like I told you, you need a, like 50s or something videos. But I was copying other styles and, you know, copying the best and what I see would work. The rhythm, the style, the music, the way they talk, the way they present, uh, the location they go to. And it's fine to copy, but then copy and then um, within that, amalgamation you know you, you take something away you form your own um yeah and then that would be you so the, the so basically what you're saying is that personal style in things that you try will probably start off as copying and then eventually right. you will develop your own brand your own style and yes. own perspective and twist on things yeah so uh learning is copying Right. Uh, anything right. we learn, you know, we learn one plus one. It's it's copying, and right. then we eventually start to understand the logic behind it, and then we could form our own opinion. Um, but yes, don't be afraid to copy. Don't just copy and paste, but copy, but take that copy and somehow, you know, form your own because you're gonna gonna copy from a hundred people, and from that hundred people is gonna bring down to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're not going to see a hundred people in one video. It's going to be a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and it's going to be you. Well, because that's exactly what I'm doing. I am copying them. Um, I'm, I'm copying their interview style. I'm copying their setup. I'm copying, you know, uh, the conversational side of it all. Um, uh, having guests on. I'm, I'm copying yeah. many, many different aspects of podcasting. But... I think I have a general direction of where I want to go. So you're right. Yes, I think I that think the more that, I do it, I'll I'll yes. see if that's the direction that yes. I want to eventually go yeah. in, and and find my own voice. Yeah. In it. Yeah, yeah and I, I find you as a, as a um, a chatting buddy, I guess you know, a talk buddy. You're you're very, uh, you're listening really well, mm. uh, and it's just not in your demeanor, but it's in your eyes. Uh, you have good eye contact, and it's you have that soft eye. You know, like mm -hmm. eyes are like very, I'm paying attention. Yes, eyes are difficult. You know, like if I'm, I'm look at you, but you know, I could be judgy. You know, eyes are hard to mm -hmm. get right. Yeah. and I think you know, like overall, you're a pretty charismatic guy. You know, you talk really well. You 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 you're well thought out. What is it? Uh, well thought out? No. Well, your thoughts, uh, yeah. Well, you're thinking, you're yeah. well thought out, you're educated, thoughtful, you're thoughtful, um, yeah. and no, thoughtful, and you're thinking well thought out as well, mm. yes. Um, so those are really good combination because obviously, you know, somehow you've been trained, you know, in your life, you know, <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, yeah, I, I've good. only been arguing with my parents all my life, uh, it's good, it's good, and uh, and try. And so, in school, I, I will say this one thing that did help me because I'm not a huge uh, like I'm not gonna go out there and tell you, hey, you need to go to college, right? You go to university and learn. Uh, that's not necessarily something that I think is necessary these days. Although I will say, if I did have kids in the future, I would probably encourage them to go to school, and I'll tell you why. Um, I had this teacher in college. It, it, it wasn't the. It's not about the university. It's about individual people. 
and like how the professor, uh, Mr. Vince, mm -hmm. inspired you. So I had a few p teachers in college that uh, encouraged me to write, write short stories, write poetry. And I thought it was a waste of time completely. I just wanted an A and move on to the next thing. And this is before I even knew I wanted to do anthropology. Um, but then there was, I was this short of getting an A in, uh, for, I had an A throughout the whole semester, but uh, at one point in the beginning months of my semester, I got a few B's and, or a couple B's and my grade went down. And, and so I wanted to like do anything and everything to try and get that A. So this teacher, this English teacher, she encouraged me and I forget her name. It sucks. I forget her name. But um, she really did change my life in a way. Uh, she encouraged me to start uh, doing extra for extra points, writing these short stories and poems and stuff. And there was a poetry slam, a poetry competition. I wasn't aware it was, a po it was a poetry competition, but she said that if I participated in the poetry competition, that she would give me, I think, 10 or 20 extra points, which I thought was like incredible. Yeah. And I was like, all right, how hard could it be? Right. So um, I sat down one day and I thought of a subject um, and then I started writing. And then as I started writing, I started correcting it and eventually I had a poem. And so uh, I think it was the day after I went to the poetry slam. And when I arrive, I open the door and there is 150 people. I mean, it was a lot of people. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> like, what is I thought it was like a small little thing. Right. Uh, Ten people, five people. Uh, but it was like over a hundred people and everybody is there to, to watch this poetry slam competition thing at the university. And, um, so I'm very nervous. I don't know exactly what's going on, but I go up and I say, Hey, I'm here to present. Are you Wilson? Yes. Okay, good. We're going to put you on the list. Well, I don't know why exactly, but, but they put me last. And so I was there for the entire poetry slam. And all I'm seeing is these amazing people that have been writing poetry probably forever, because that's what it seemed like. Um, we're going up there and killing and just like beautiful poetry. Like, wow. Like, I didn't know poetry could be that beautiful. Yeah. And and here I am with like a poetry that I made the day before. Uh, and... And I was going to go up there. So anyways, long story long, I end up going right before this guy who everybody was expecting to see there. In other words, this guy was kind of like known in the poetry sphere. Um, and they were waiting for him to to do his poem. Um, and so he he did his poem and it blew, it blew everybody away. It blew me away. It was great. It was beautiful. This guy definitely... You know, is is a well educated individual and and has studied poetry and everything, um, and everybody's applauding and standing up and giving him a standing ovation, and I'm like, wait, I have to go after this guy? That's crazy! Like, I I, you know, I was like, no, that's a wrap. Right. Like, uh, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna do it. But I decided to go and and I did it. And um, what happened was that halfway through the poem, I got this second wind where it wasn't me saying the poem. It was like somebody else saying the poem. Like I became the poem, right? I know that sounds cheesy and corny, but, but I really, it, it was almost as if like there was barely anybody there and I felt free to just express myself and communicate and, and share my feelings. Um, and because it was, it was that kind of poem. It was about my dad. And then at the end of it, like, I'm almost in tears and, and, and then I stop and then there's silence and I'm like, Oh my God, what is like, what is this? What's going on? And then the room just erupts with like applauses and screams and whistles and everything. And, and, and I'm like, wow. And so anyways, my professor comes up to me 
and she gives me a big hug and she goes like, oh my God, that was so wonderful. That was so great. And, uh, and that guy still won, but I got second place out of like 20 people and, and it was a huge event and everything. Anyway, so that, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you don't know what you don't know. I, I started, uh, uh, this journey down, you know, learning how to write and create and use all of that to then hone in on my own story and my own voice. And once you put it out there, I really think that, you know, if, if it's genuine and it's authentic and it's honest, I think people will listen. I think people will, will reach out. I think you will surprise yourself. Yeah. You know, so, I agree. So and it's a good, yeah. it's in line yeah. with what you're saying right. about pick up your camera exactly. wherever you are, right. start documenting yourself, start right. filming yourself, start talking about where you're at, what you're doing, what you see, because these are things that people already see, but they're now going to see it through your perspective, through your lens. Right. And I think that that's so important. Right. And, and, you know, and uh, you're inspiring me to do more of that. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, is there a way we could hear some of that poem? Oh, my God. No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Not because I don't uh, I don't want to, but I don't rem I don't have it anymore. I don't right. remember. This was like my my sophomore year in college. So this was. Oh, I would love to hear it. Oh, my God. This was uh, I probably have it somewhere, honestly. Oh, yeah. 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 It was about my dad. It was it was kind of like, you know, yeah. a tender but sorrow story about my dad yeah, yeah, yeah. uh so it, it touched many yeah. hearts yeah you know, i'm I sure, can tell. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah everybody has some sort of yeah. daddy issue <laughs> oh yeah i have i have huge daddy issues <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about this I'm yeah, sure. yeah yeah you yeah. have to like you know i love you i give you the whip oh my god yes yes as a matter of fact yeah i i can only remember the one time in my life that i heard my dad complimenting me mm. and i wasn't in the same room <laughs> oh, are you serious? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I woke up one morning. I, I remember that's when I just got into law school. I, I got the letter of acceptance. And, you know, my dad was elated. And nice. he was in the living room. I was in the bedroom. I had just woken up. And I heard him talking on the phone with you know, a, a buddy of his. Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, I'm happy that he's blah, blah, blah. And got accepted, blah, blah, blah. That was it, you know. Um, and he, he said that I was good, good as in like, you know, good as... That you did good? That I did well. That you did well, yeah. That I, that I did really well. I'm like That was the one time that I could kind of, you know, recollect. Um, so you're already an adult. <laughs> yes. And this was just a few years ago. Jesus, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, and man, it, it's... Yeah. So he's changing. That means he's... He's evolving. But you see, like, he wouldn't show, like, he's one of those macho men that, it's too macho, and I don't agree with that, but he, he didn't show us any, like, uh, he, he wouldn't say, I love you, or he, he wouldn't hug us, mm -hmm. uh, or he wouldn't say, well done, good job, you know? Yes. He would just be him. If we did a good job, he would just be him. Or maybe he expressed in a way that we didn't understand. Right, because that, that happens too, right? Yeah, probably. Parents just are hardened yeah. over time and through experiences, yeah. and they don't know how to express love and that's true. And stuff. And and so they do it their own way. Maybe his way was just to like help you get to the United States, or yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, you know what I'm saying like maybe providing for me, providing and, you know, for you, always wanting for you not to be involved in betting, yeah, and, in and drugs, and drugs, and devices, yeah. and stuff. So he had his way. So in, in his own way, in his own strict ways, you know, like I could see the love, but it took me many years and it took me deep into adulthood to see that, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and what about those formative years? You know, what if I had seen that love a little bit earlier on, on my journey, right? Yeah. I mean, we could all use a little bit of that. Um, so now, even when I talk to my brothers, I have uh, three older brothers. And I always tell them, oh, we talk and, you know, we just, we can't be like that anymore. You know, we have to raise our kids, compliment them, be strict, um, be a role model, but compliment them, um, express ourselves, you know, don't, yes. don't, don't be one of those. Share your feelings. Share your feelings, yeah. <clears throat> um, I don't believe in sharing everything, you know, like, but, you know. But with family, When you it's do. due, when it's due, you have to give it. 
Right. Yeah. Are any of your brothers already kind of like your dad? Like, are you seeing that some of them are like getting um, there? You, you see episodes here and there, but yeah, yeah. but ninety, I say ninety percent of the time. Um, even now, like my brothers are pretty good at uh, at controlling themselves and just be aware. Mm -hmm. um, but I did see a few episodes of you know it, just like this is years ago. Um, but they have gotten out so much better. Uh, they're more understanding. Um, they're going through life more in a way. They're getting older, so they see life differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's just that you know. Maybe yeah. it's the uh, I don't know how it is in Puerto Rico, but in Vietnam back in the day, or even in rural Vietnam, kids just go out, just go play outside, and then parents would go do their own thing. Mm. Kids would go and play outside, play with dirt, whatever. <laughs> Literally play with dirt. Um, so there's not a whole lot of that connection, you know. Yeah. The dad gets home, it's already late. He's tired. He's off to bed, mm. you know. And the kids already asleep by then, you know. He comes home. How's school? School's good. You know, they talk for like a few minutes. That was it. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of moments together. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you're born in a poor family that doesn't help either because your parents are always struggling to make ends meet so mm -hmm. you know they don't really have time to care about your feeling and take you to do nice things you know it's just things like that right it, it's a little bit harder yeah but i understand i understand I see yeah in puerto rico is more uh it, it was a case by case because in puerto rico is still technically part of the united states so it's very americanized yeah in many ways yeah so but it, i guess it was kind of case by case family by family right my mom was uh the overprotective type mm. so uh, i grew up in a in a, a, a community uh, of houses that was gated uh but there were different like sections of that right. community like because right. it was a very large community right um, and my mom would only let me basically go around my block, even mm -hmm. though it was a giant community, everything was gated, everything was safe and there were people everywhere, kids everywhere. My mom wanted me close to home. Right. Always. Right. Um, and that's just how I grew up, you know? And I think that as I grew up as probably with everybody, just talking about psychologic, like psychologically and how that works, I think that everybody kind of just like imitates or, or, or yeah. uh, uh, they express their feelings similar to how they're raised right exactly. right yeah um and so it took me a while to kind of become a more uh well uh, spoken thoughtful individual because back then i was so uh uh sheltered that it was hard for me to express my feelings correctly like i would act a fool right in bigger groups you know and i i, I was kind of like it was weird i was shy but also wanted to be the center of attention but it's also because i just didn't know where i fit in you right. know with right. people and uh, it didn't help that i was born in america but i was raised in puerto rico so i went to puerto rico speaking english and not mm -hmm. spanish so right. for a brief period of time there was a disconnect between me and my peers in school um, and that created all sorts of problems there with just the language barrier alone. Right. And um, so in your neighborhood, was there any game problem, anything that would know you like that? Okay. Nothing. Was, so it was, it was a better off neighborhood. Yeah. So, just, yeah. You, we were definitely well off in that, in, in that sense. And right. anyways, we, we weren't rich or anything, but my community was, you know, hardworking people, similar right. age kids, uh, uh, standard kind of suburban type, you know, nice. kind of a little bit removed from like the city, still on the outskirts of the yeah. city though. So, um, nicer houses. Um, uh, if you, if you, if you went just a little bit like 15, 20 minutes further away from the area that I lived in, you were probably more like going into rural mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. Um, so we were kind of just in the middle there. Um, and I, and I can't say that I had a bad upbringing whatsoever right. but being sheltered definitely brings its own set of issues growing up yeah. because like i said you don't you don't you don't know how to communicate really well because you're you're surrounded by just the same group of people you know some kids also lots of adults so you know um 
I never really had a sense of like really close, close friends because my friends would stay up and, you know, all night hanging out even at a young age 10 12 in my community the kids would be all around like midnight two in the morning the kids would still be around my mom was like sundown you are here or else right. i'm gonna go and find you right you know that kind of yeah, stuff yeah same same thing with my dad yeah we should be home before he does or before he oh did. interesting yeah if yeah. we got caught out you know after he got home oof, it's another whipping yeah, that's kind of how it, it wasn't similar to that, but it was like, yeah, at sunset. My, if my mom went and got me, it was better. If my dad went to go oh, get yeah. me, that was worse. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember. You know, sometimes I would mess up in, in, in I would mess up in school, uh, got in fights or something, I would break the rules or something, and then they would ask all the parents mm -hmm. to come uh, to have a talk with the the dean at the time. And you know, if I if I saw my mom riding into the school, I'd be like, yes, it'll be okay. Thank God, it'll be okay. She will protect me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but you know, I swear to God, there were a few times where I hear my dad riding the the Vespa, and you know, that Vespa has a very t -t 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 sound, yeah. very unique sound. Yeah. And every time I hear that sound, it's like trauma. You know, it, it it's crazy. It's gotten to that point. Um, yeah, and. I would hear him riding into the schoolyard like, God darn it, he's... Gone. He's going to take their side. He's going to take the Dean's side. And I'm I don't know which side he's going to take, but it ain't going to be mine. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, he's going to whip me, yes. And and he did whip me. Yeah. Um, so, so is that why you started to, like, <laughs> learn karate? <laughs> no, not really. Um... <laughs> It's so just, your dad was okay with karate? Did he encourage karate, or did no, that kind of that come was, more naturally from you? Or yeah, it was a, a me thingy. Uh, I started doing a lot of you know. Um, I first started a lot of things in my family. In a way, I was the first person ever to go to law school nice. in my family, and not just in my family, but in my distant my distant family as well. Got it. Um, uh, so we had. Maybe one, two doctor. I was the second person in the family with a doctor degree ever. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle followed suit with his uh, medical doctor degree. Um, so that was the first. And then I kind of just kind of went into martial art world kind of blindly. But then growing up in Asia, you cannot help but live in this pool of, of martial art and kung fu culture. Mm. you can't help it and it's not just about Bruce Lee a lot of let's just say American they're obsessed with Bruce Lee and that's their version of, of Chinese martial art Eastern martial art but to us we have so many more other other Kung Fu legends that we could follow and uh, there's real there are many famous Kung Fu martial art novels from China that started the whole legend of Kung Fu started, you know, uh, in Vietnam, in Southeast Asia, in Japan, in South Korea. Uh, his his Vietnamese his Chinese name in Vietnamese way is Kim Yung, but I don't know how to spell it in uh, in English. But he started with you know different style, and when you watch Kung Fu movies, you see different style, tiger claws, you know, like uh, or monkey's fist and crane's fist. All that came from Shaolin Temple, but also romanticized by these novels. Mm. And they're so famous. They are like, I mean, they're like the Bible of Asia. They were everywhere. They were turned into movies, TV shows, and other children's storybooks, everything. And you, living in Asia, you cannot escape that. And you cannot help but fantasize a life with with martial art and kung fu and you just travel the world fight people you know duel people and you know get in with hot chicks that was the life of those novels novels so i at 20 years old i think it was 20 years old uh i started looking into doing martial arts and you know when I, at first i i wanted to do karate i wanted not specifically karate but i wanted to do something that had a belt because i wanted a black belt I wanted to show off that I have a black belt. Mm -hmm. I would just be cool. And I saw Muay Thai. Muay Thai didn't have a belt. So I'm like, oh, man, I would love a belt. Wing Chun is pretty cool. I don't know if you know Wing Chun. Yeah. The close 
fighting. Winchin's is uh, fascinating. Bands. Yeah, <clears throat> Winchin's amazing. Uh, Bruce Lee's uh, teacher, first teacher, was a Wing Chun master. Really? Yip Man. Yeah. Um, there are some great movies I will show you. Um, so I look into Wing Chun. Wing Chun, it just, um, I don't know, it didn't really fit me. And then somehow I was browsing on YouTube and saw this video. It's called The Strongest Karate. I was like, The Strongest Karate? What the hell? So I clicked on it, and the, the style was absolutely different. Absolutely brutal. Um, they fight full contact, no mm -hmm. gloves, no shin pads, no helmets whatsoever. You can wear a uh, mouth guard yeah. and, and a groin cup, and that's it. And these two guys just pounding at each other, just pounding it. Huge dude. And just I got fascinated. I contacted uh, a dojo, and there was... There happened to be a dojo right next to my college at the time, Santa Monica College. And there I found my sensei. You know, he's now a shihan, which is a master. Mm. A sensei is a teacher. Uh, a shihan is a master title, and his name is Tom Callahan. He's in uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado now. Um, I started on Halloween night, uh, 2011. Uh, little did I know that he would become like a mentor and a father to me. Mm -hmm. He would guide me in everything in life. And, you know, he structured and influenced uh, my way, of, uh, my vision and my way of life. And then, and how would I say this? Um, my life philosophy in a way. Yeah. The way I talk to people, the way I carry myself, the way I compliment people more. Um, you know, because I stop giving you the whip because I love you. No, I start complimenting you because I love you. Right. So that that changed my whole approach. Yeah, and he showed me uh, a way of martial art that is soft but stern. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're you're disciplined. You're a hard man. You're a dangerous man. But anywhere you go, you're soft. You're nice. You know, you don't have to show who you like. E that's ego. You don't have to show off. Uh, right. There's one thing. So he's preparing you for war. Yes. But the way that he prepares when you for the war, war is through discipline. When the battle calls for it, then you show. Then up. you're ready. You're yes. Prepared. Um. So even take shaking hands, for example. In Western culture, uh, when you shake hands, it's a firm handshake, and you got to be strong. You know, you you squeezing a little, but you don't want to squeeze too much, but you're firm to show that you're strong. Yeah. Even though you're shaking on the inside, you show that you're firm. Uh, in Japanese culture, you shake very softly. You know, but eventually now it's kind of changed to like a firm handshake. But to us karatekas, uh, we shake very soft. With two hands, we bow extremely soft. Mm. You know, it, it's like here, we try and shake like that. Got it. You barely feel barely, pressure. barely, very, very soft. Uh, in a way, you are confident in yourself. You're not letting the handshake dictate who you are and whether you are you are weak or whether you are strong. Mm. You are strong because you are strong. You know who you are. Right. You know. Yes. Yes. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, you're approaching it from like, like if I were to squeeze your hand because right. I can tell that you're doing it softly, and I just want to be right. an asshole, I'm gonna squeeze it as hard as I right. can. You're gonna be like, oh, this guy. Yeah, there's is no probably need. there's no need. For yeah, there's it. some ego there. You can tell a lot about that person right off the bat. Right. How they shake right. your hand. So literally, why the need to squeeze my hand so hard? Right. What are you trying to prove? Right. What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to do? Are you trying right. to fight? Are right. You trying, like, what's going on? Yeah. So to me, it's not just a handshake. It's what you have to back up that handshake. Gotcha. You know? Yes. If you come in for an interview, you shake my hand really well, and you have nothing to show, what is that going to matter? It doesn't matter right. anywhere. Right. Um, but you shake me, uh, shake my hand in a respectful way, soft. In Western culture, kind of firm, uh, and you have something to back that up. Man, it's so much more interesting, and it's much so more. So there's nuanced. like a subtle confidence. Yeah, that's already expressed it's, through just like it's called it's called humble confidence, a humble brag in a way. Mm. You know, it's like I'm so strong. Why do I need to show you that I'm strong? Right. You know. Right, and also part of martial arts is 
in a way to be deceptive in in that you know how to do martial arts right like you don't want your opponent to know that you know something right that you know more than him or anything like that so you always yeah. want to maybe approach it from like a uh, right. humble like it appears as if i don't know anything but don't let that fool you yeah but but as you train and the more you mature in the martial art you know there's uh, there's going to be giveaways you don't you don't carry yourself in in such a confident way you know in your eyes in your gesture, in the way you sit, right. that that people will tell this guy is confident. Mm, the you way know? you stand, the way you stand, posture, the yeah. way you're so aware with everything. You you look them directly in the eye. You're not afraid of them. You're not you know cowering. Mm. People know that. Yeah. And people pick up on that. That's how bully you know pick up on their praise. And that's how and predators too pick up on their praise. Right. Um, they pick on the weakest, and it's usually the people that are. Yeah. Trying to remove themselves, cower away right. from the situation. It starts with the eye contact. It starts with the demeanor. You know, right. that's how it is. But yes. but um, that's the that's the Eastern uh, philosophy when it comes to martial art. You know, in in Western you know philosophy, you can see it just be strong. You know, show that you're strong. Mm. You know, yeah. Um, just be who you are. If you're strong, you're strong. But uh, yeah, in Japanese culture, they they're very. How do you guys say it? They're very reserved. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to brag. Uh, I mean, the perfect example of that is like, we have a movie about that. The Karate Kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have the, the young, yeah. rebellious, brazen, loud kid who wants to be tough. And, you right. Know, right. And then here comes this right. master karate <laughs> yeah. guy who doesn't look like he's a master karate guy whatsoever. Right. And he starts teaching him things that almost seemingly have nothing to do with karate. Right. And yet what he was doing the whole time was like building his confidence. Exactly. Changing him mentally to understand that yes. it's through discipline right. and this sub subtle humbleness right. is where you're gonna gain your strength. That that's perfectly it. You know, if you just keep your head down with it and when it comes to martial art there's no secret. Mm. There is literally zero secret. There is so much material out there that you can learn on your own. <laughs> literally, you can learn moves. And some people learn just watching UFCs. Right. Learning how to do a good joke. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, but there's no... Uh, sorry, I was saying there's no secret. You just have to grind. Right. The harder you grind and the more focus you pay to it, the better you will get. Like <laughs> There's literally no secret. I wish there was a secret scroll... I, I think it's everything, right? Like you said, uh, doing 20 videos yeah. uh, for podcasting exactly. your video, you're going to get yeah. there. Yeah. Same with like martial arts. You just keep going. Yeah. Even if, yeah. and sometimes I'll admit, I do, we both do jujitsu together as yeah. well. When we, I personally right. love it. We love it. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely built my character. He's right about like the way that it changes you psychologically, your posture changes, your confidence changes. And all of that starts with like these little tiny adjustments that you don't even real in martial arts and jujitsu in this case but like i started gaining a lot more confidence because i was just standing a certain way you know mm -hmm. my, my stance when i'm standing i'm prepared to either fight or run away you know i'm in okay. not that i'm in flight or fight necessarily all the time but what i mean is i'm very self-aware of my surroundings and i'm constantly like paying attention to the people in the room i sometimes jokingly have told andy like yo how many people do you think are in this room hmm. you know like can, do you know how many men are in this room do you know how many women are in this room and and i do that i play with those thoughts sometimes uh when i go places just to keep my brain a little bit more self-aware um uh, of my surroundings but yeah my stance has changed my posture has changed my confidence i've seen it increase um uh, uh, you know uh, uh, everything my stamina my cardio yeah. my strength even though I'm thinner now um, and have lost some weight and, and muscle I actually feel stronger than ever and I think that that comes partly from the confidence of doing jiu-jitsu but I think also that I'm prepared you know I feel prepared yeah. for a moment where I might have to yeah. possibly like defend myself or or, or, or flee or or you know just be aware if I'm with friends or family I want to protect them I want to uh, make sure that they are you know uh, not, not in harm's way in any way 
And so I'm always looking for that. You know, you always find me standing at the end of the, the pack of the group. You always see me looking at like the exit doors. You know, you may or may not. I may not make it that obvious, but but that is what is in my head yeah. anyways. And all of that came from martial, martial arts. arts being, yeah. You know, it comes from training. Uh, right. Training will give you that because you have to be aware, you know, where the kicks are coming, the punches are coming. And a good teacher will make you a make you aware of those things your surroundings uh you just can't help it it's just things that you do uh, i don't know like subconsciously <laughs> yes yeah i always sit with my back against the wall uh that or i would always face the the door i would never sit with my back against the door just little things like that but it's good that, that you're thinking in that way dude. like that's the way to go and that's how you train martial art and it's not just in the dojo like I think I told you just a few weeks ago, training is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Karate is everywhere. Right. Jiu-Jitsu is everywhere. Whatever martial art you do is everywhere. You're sitting on the plane, you know, like I'll be sitting, you can just like work on your hand just like this. It can condition your hand. Uh, you can even stretch your fingers, you know, just things like that. Squeeze and um, yeah, anything, anywhere in training. If you're thinking about martial art, it, that's training. Right. Yeah. Well, it's more than that, right? Yeah. It's discipline. Yeah. It's it's that you're you're making sure that your mind is always focused on some goal. Yes. Learning something yes. new or yes. different or from a different perspective. Yeah. You know, I, I've told you this too, um, and this is something that you guys can do at home. Um, at the end of my day, every day, I'll take five minutes, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. But I'll reflect on my day. I'll kind of run a picture, a movie in my head of every single moment of that day. And obviously it won't be second by second. I'm going to be jumping around in my head and that movie will be jumping around different things. But it'll be thing, one thing after another. Bah, 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 bah. And I will basically reflect in five minutes time about my whole day. I'll sit at the edge of my bed and I'll just sit there and I'll think about it. I woke up, I did that, okay. I washed clothes, that's good. I did this and then I went to work, okay, that was good. You know, I interviewed, you know, my friend Andy, okay, that was a good day, that was productive. By the end of that, I will have basically an assessment of my day and then I will put a feeling towards it. I will say the day was mostly good because I got something done because I did this, because I did that, because I did jujitsu, because I exercised, because I ate well, because I, and, and so I'll add it all up and I will say today was a mostly good day or today was a great day or sometimes today was not such a good day. And these, you know, and these are the reasons why, you know, um, and I think that that, for example, specifically with jujitsu has helped me a lot because I'll go and I'll train. And it's easy to just train and then leave, you know, exercise and then leave the gym or your dojo or whatever. And then you just go home and go about your day. Um, but I decided that I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on my drive home, when I'm preparing food, whatever, on reflecting on my training. Did I exercise well enough? Did I do a good job? Did anybody compliment me? Did I feel like I got something out of it um, and if and, and I, again I'll make a little assessment and then I'll say yes it was mostly a good training day uh, and I'll do that with you know different things but you could do it at the end of the day you can do it with specific things it's just a way to reflect on the past and then let it go you just think about it and you let it go and you move on because the present is very valuable. The, 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 the thing in life that has the most value is your present moment, this time right now. Um, it's worth to study the past so that you don't make mistakes in the future, but you can only really live in the present. So you reflect on the past and then you leave it in the past. You don't bring the past to the present. Uh, simultaneously, you don't want to live in the future either, because if you live in the future, then you're not focusing on what you need to do right now. You can't reflect 
on the future. You can only reflect on the past and you can set goals for your future. And you do both of those things. You think about those things in the present. So That's a perfect way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, and I and I do that every day. I do that. It did, you know, and that has helped me so much with my confidence. Yeah. It has helped me so much with like jujitsu. It has helped me so much with my friendships. It has helped me so much with my family. Um, you know how I, I treat my family. Uh, it has helped me with goal setting, leaving things in the past that have been very bad, you know, very bad experiences. Everybody's had bad experiences in the past and we like to bring those into the present and we like to live in those moments and, and, and just, you know, just live in, in those memories to try and um, maybe relive them because we're, we're, we're so attracted to the pain. Not attracted, but like the pain is within us. So we're trying to kind of like relive those moments just to I don't know how to say we're addicted to, to to these memories sometimes whether they're good or they're bad we hold on to them but they belong in the past they, they belong in the past they're there as experiences for you to move forward and become the person that you are meant to become uh, and to evolve into you can't evolve if you're constantly thinking about the past, whether it was, again, good memories or bad memories. So if your dad or your mom was beating you when you were growing up, those were terrible experiences, but you can learn from those and leave them in the past. And you can do that through reflection. Um, same thing with like good memories. Maybe you lived an incredible life most of your life. Maybe, you know, you, you made a bunch of money uh, and then you know, you lived like a king and then you lost it all, right? And you're just, you know, but but again, you leave those moments in the past. If you made a bunch of money in the past, well, guess what? It's the same mind that helped you get that bunch of money in the past is the same mind that you have now. If anything, it's better because you've had those experiences of going up and down. And now you can learn from that and come back and and do it all over again and make money and, and and all that stuff so um yeah, that, i think reflection yeah, allows people perfect, to grow yeah. yeah that's perfect you know that that reminds me of my uh um martial art teaching um uh, this meditation reflection is it, just it's another word for meditation um so uh, i notice when a lot of people when they try to meditate um they they focus on the wrong things when you try to uh, uh if i could share this with you guys when you try to meditate or reflect, <clears throat> sit down, relax, um, go go through on the memories of your day or whatever memories. Just let them flow through. Do mm -hmm. not dwell on them. So people will try to tell you to have no mind, to don't think about anything at all. You just can't help it. Subconsciously, your brain is running. Right. Um, and consciously, it's also running. And, and it's going through these images and memories and data. But just let it go let those memories pass through let it flow by and don't dwell on them whether it's good or bad what you do when you meditate is you focus on your breathing and you're trying to take in and out breath you know, you're trying to slow down your breathing that will slow down your heart rate that will slow down your metabolism and your brain will calm yourself down and then eventually you will reach that point where memories, images gonna fly past at a slow rate. And then eventually it's just gonna be your breathing. You're just gonna hear yourself inhale and exhale. And the best way to do it is when you can have around four to three breaths a minute. And you know, we do this in, in our karate pra uh, practice all the time. At the end of training, we would just focus um, and uh, meditate and try to slow down a breath to four or five breaths per minute and it's hard yeah you know, when you start out you could do probably maybe 10 12 and then you can bring it down to seven eight but four or five that's hard yeah but that's that's really good yeah that's great yeah. advice and I, I'm gonna incorporate that yeah my it's great reflecting and, time yeah and also his um, he brought up a really good point that you know training martial art is I think it's the only the the best thing that you can do for yourself um, to improve your confidence 
and uh, your ability to handle tough, stressful situations that doesn't involve, uh, that doesn't require a lot of other people because martial arts for yourself and you get what you put into it. Lifting also great, but eventually you will have to be uh, put, you will be put in situation where fight needs to happen or your fight skills is required, mm -hmm. you know, and that will somehow, uh, and your inability to fight will somehow, how to say it, uh, dampen your confidence in a way. You know, even though you have all these muscles, all these muscles, and you look great, ladies love you, but then when you're confronted, you're just a big, tough guy, but you have no skill to fight. Mm. But when you can fight, you know you can dominate other men. And that, so, there, that, that you're talking about mental toughness. That's also mental toughness, right. and that directly correlates with your confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, even though you're a smaller guy, but you're a great fighter. Right. Nobody's going to mess with you. Yes. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. jujitsu, for example, I've been purposefully fighting, or what we call rolling, fighting bigger men. And, and obviously, it's mostly men. Um, and, and I specifically go and train with bigger opponents. Because for me, martial arts, it's about a mental toughness. It's about, it doesn't matter what situation you are in doesn't matter how tough the situation seems or how hard the situation may be you have the mental fortitude yeah. and strength to still go out there and attack that problem no matter what the problem is so and uh to give you a star trek reference and show how nerdy i am there's something called the kobayashi maru <laughs> you know what the kobayashi yes, maru is yes. So, uh, for those that don't know, the Kobayashi Maru is a test that they did in Starfleet for Star Trek cadets, Starfleet cadets, I should say, uh, where you have, they put you and a team of you in a, in a what they call a no-win scenario. In other words, the, the scenario that you're going to be put in uh, has no solution. It is meant for you to fail. Right. Because if you fail, you will, you know, according to Starfleet, they believe that by having you fail, you will become more aware of how important it is to, uh, number one, find out how mentally tough you are. Number two, how well can you work with your team and how to keep them calm. And number three, is there really no way out? You know, is is failing the only option? Because if failing is the only option, then you still are going to have to find a way to make the best of that situation, knowing the impending doom that is about to come down on you. And it's in those moments of impending doom that real men and real women are actually created. When there is a, a situation that you think you can't get out of, that you've been thinking about for days and weeks and months at a time and 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 you know that there is this moment where you don't know what you're going to do that you might give up that that you might fail that you don't know what you're going to do next right you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from you don't know where your relationship is going uh you don't know if you're going to get fired at work there's these impending dooms that are they're almost out of your control right seemingly out of your control and then how do you deal with that situation how do you then become mentally tough right. to deal with that that's what martial arts has done for me it's created this mental fortitude like a barrier of of how should i describe it it's like a it's almost like a warrior's Gear uh -huh. yeah. like armor, yeah, that's but in the brain. True. That's very true. But in the brain, it's like armor yeah. for the brain. It is so true. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, once you put that armor on, is your you feel invincible. You feel so strong. You feel so strong. Yeah, and, and that, it's a mental thing. It's yeah. not even how you're yeah. physically. Yeah, and and you how know? strong your armor is, it totally depends on you. You know how much work do you put into making that armor. Right, and it's totally it's just you. 
It's just you. It just it's you, you nobody, against you. Yeah, yeah. That's why I keep saying martial arts is the best way to build your confidence. Nobody else can build armor for you. I agree. I feel so euphoric yeah. after I train. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know that run is high. You know that trainer is high. Right. It happens yeah. literally after every class. For me. I feel great. Man. I feel I so feel, good. I feel amazing. You know. Um. Yeah. I would encourage everybody to sign up for martial art. But then you know the the pitfall is, for a lot of, this is how McDojo's happen out there. Are so many. McDojo. People don't know. Check out McDojo's on Instagram. It's a hilarious page um, about people that don't know how to do martial arts teaching martial arts. Yeah, it's just, you know, for, for amateurs, for novices and beginners, how do you pick a good dojo and good teachers? It's right. Just, you just can't. You just don't know. You just hope and pray that you run into a good teacher. Otherwise, it's just... Oof. So, um, I wanted to talk to you finally about something that is been weighing on my mind and that is because i've been noticing some trends that point in a direction that i don't quite i'm not quite sure where we're heading in in this sphere which is um so you're doing youtube you're doing you're an influencer now you have tens of thousands of subscribers um where do you see the future of influencing? Do you see more influencing? You know, do you see more people picking up a camera and starting to, you know, uh, create content? Uh, and uh, also, I've noticed a trend with AI where a lot of people are putting out content that is artificial, that is not authentic in the sense that it's not human content it's created by humans but through filters basically right ai is you have only fan models now that are complete yeah. ai you have instagram accounts that are full ai you have all these companies like facebook and google and microsoft they're putting out their own versions of ai for like google assist like google assistance and or ai assistance so a lot of people are now using a lot of AI and will obviously continue to use more and more and more and more AI. What does that mean for influencers like you? And do you see a point in time where content creation is mostly created by AI rather than humans? And it's just basically AI putting together images and videos of things that they find online and creating their own content and movies even and, and podcasts and we're all just consumers of ai content rather yeah. than real people like you who are out there putting yourself sometimes even in harm's way to create content and, and expose things that the 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 layman the common person has not been exposed to yeah, I think with the uh, with the development of the, the the smartphone and people having access, easy access to smartphone and great cameras around nowadays, um, uh, you start seeing a lot of people, you know, getting on social media, TikTok, and uh, making videos, you know, with a snap of the finger. It's so fast, mm -hmm. and they can literally capture anything they want to. Right. And then that's the that's what we see is the the proliferation of of, of videos and content. It's everywhere, mm -hmm. and I'm glad it's happening because it'll allows us to be creative and allows us another uh, avenue in life to express ourselves and to capture our you know most precious moments and that's the reality that we have now and I, I keep seeing that continue on because there's so much money in it for any app developer or for any company to come up with an app as addicting or even more addicting than Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok and YouTube. You know, mm -hmm. I see those apps coming and the attention span of people are going to get keep shorting and shorting and shorting and shorter. Um, and more content is going to be out there. So, like you said, you know, like, so how can we make, how, would, how do we stand out? Right. So we leave the AI questions for, for a little bit later. But how do we stand out? You know, with the proliferation of, of this massive content from everyone, I, I, I guess you just need to start going to harder reach places, more remote places. Mm, you need to start having your own style. That's what we talked about. You know, being yourself is just so important. 
because uh, you know when you be you, you who can be you you know like Snoop Dogg said I think right. one time <laughs> and just just start something find something unique find something that the, the the mass cannot get access to you know if you have to travel 2,000 kilometers 2,000 miles go for it you gotta climb a mountain to get to it go for it uh, those are the things that are gonna make you stand out if you're gonna capture everyday content like food you know again go to far remote places to capture food um, but also you know learn to edit video and capture video present video in such a way that is uniquely you because I keep you know harping on this one point just be you because once you be you who can't be you um, but now like uh, Wilson just mentioned with the uh, with the emergence of AI so what's going to happen? Is AI going to take over the content creating world? Um, part of it, I, I think so, because that's exactly what AI is created for. You know, it's created for it's created for helping and 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 elevating and and smoothing these wrinkles in in our struggles of everyday life. You know, like these grind that you talk about, right? So AI is there to smooth things out to help you make content faster, to, to um, help you plan things. And how do we stand out from there? Again, it gets down to the nitty and gritty of it. And, you know, get down to the people, get down to the remote places, have access to unique information that only you can go uh, where AI hasn't gone before. Um, AI can compile conversation online and you know start creating a film per se, but then eventually people will know that it is AI. You know, I'm sure there will be a lot that say it's AI. You know, we have a lot that say you know whether this is soy milk or not, it is cow milk. Um, so eventually, those are gonna come in place to to distinguish um, you know AI content from human content. Mm. So I think that's one direction that the law can go to help aid. Um, our adaptation of AI. Um, yeah, it's just... I, I mean, I lost a train of thought, but just, yeah, just be you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess what I pick up from what you're saying is there will still be space for human content oh, yeah. creation. It'll probably, hopefully, be labeled as such so that you know that it's not an actual, like, yeah. artificial intelligence yeah. running it. Um, and, and what I hear also is that, you know, the guy that, for example, in Vietnam was up in the mountain, yeah. he decided to turn the camera on himself. Right. And then all of a sudden he had tens of thousands of subscribers, right. which means that that far remote place was not far remote for him. Right. He was already there. Yeah. Why not create content right. in places that are unique already? And if you have to then, as a person that wants to do that and create content, right. then going to these places also is worthwhile. So either you are in the location that's already worthwhile being in, right. or you're going to travel to these places because AI can't necessarily yeah, create content there, the way yeah. that you're going to create right. content and or has right. been in these remote places yeah and the kind of yeah. connection you you form as a human as a person to person is going to be different you know every time right uh, you know ai of course they can have access to that and compile a movie per se um and learn from our pattern um but you know i i think there's going to be still room for human emotions and human uh ingenuity and, uh, and creativity and creativity to, to be there um yeah i mean yeah it could be useful i could see it you so know you're still gonna be the, in business huh you're still gonna be in business I you're still gonna be oh yeah oh, oh yeah oh yeah yeah so even if ai takes over you're still gonna create content oh absolutely and you'll adapt absolutely and find yes. ways to stand out yes. and continue yes. moving forward with what you're passionate yes. about regardless of what Right, the atmosphere you right. surrounded yourself with. I mean that that that's the story of life. You gotta adapt. You gotta evolve. You know. Right. Yeah. You yeah. Guys? I think the same thing. I think yeah. that AI is going to probably dominate most markets. You oh, know. Yeah. I think they'll be used in and everything. Oh, yeah. uh, but and but especially in creating content and right. and um, I think that there probably will come a time where AI 
will be uh, creative. I think right. it will have a chance to. It will be creative. Yeah, it yeah. will get to the point where it can actually create its own right. creative content. Yes. Um, and and hopefully by then there have been certain things laid out in the law to identify that this AI is not sentient, but kind of directing its own course right. with its own content. Um, and that would be very interesting to see. But I agree with you. I think that there's just a human element yeah. that yeah. is always going to be necessary because, like you said, nobody can be Andy, right. nobody can be Wilson. Right. Um, and not to mention that the human element for me is the my background. Right. Where I come up, I, I grew up, I was raised, my experiences, right. all of that leads to one voice. Mm -hmm. It creates one voice exactly. that has all of these things in the background, right. whereas AI doesn't have a human element, a soul, let's say, right. to really extract something that can connect on a very, very deep level. Not yet, anyways. Yeah. Not yet. Um, not yet, right. which is a very important note, a very important point. Not yet, anyways. Uh, but I think that in that time period, until that happens, the human element, the, to be able to connect with your audience uh, uh, from your personal background, like people are going to want to see your face. Right. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. They're going to want to know more about you. Where right. do you come from? Right. You know? Yeah. Oh, he's from Vietnam. Oh, my God. Tell me more about Vietnam. Right. Oh, you studied in, in California. Tell me more about your experiences right. in California. That whole life that you've lived yeah. is part of your face. Exactly. It's part of your mind. It's yeah. part of your thoughts. Right. It's, it's part of you being alive. Right. And I think that people want crave that connection to the human element yes. yes to know more about the individual in front of the camera not it's not just anymore about the celebrity and how good they look right yeah it's now about the influencer and how are they able to influence well yes, they're able exactly. to influence yeah. because they are human yeah. and they have that that you know I don't know French, but like that je ne sais quoi, je ne sais quoi. you know, that, that, yeah. that flair about them right. that is their personality that, is that has been built through experiences. People want to know that story. Mm -hmm. And then eventually people get old and if they become celebrities, they write a memoir, right? And then people go and they buy the memoir right. of that person because they want to know more about that person's right. life. Right. That exactly. is all still part of the human element yeah. that I think allows for content creation to be uh so much better you know it, i think so you know? it, it would be so much better you know the all these you know compilation of you know let's just say top 10 tour destinations and all that that can be handled by ai that's a good point you know all of that right done out the window now people have to really dig deep down and you know, go into the emotional heart-wrenching you know touching stuff Yes. Go and really connect uh, with genuine the storytelling. Really, really good storytelling. Um, you know that that touches human soul. You know that is where humans can thrive, and we've been thriving on that. I agree yeah. with that a hundred percent. I think yeah. storytelling is probably one of the paths that is easiest for the future influencers right. if they really know how to do it. Right. You know, if right. you can go somewhere, right. Guatemala, Belize, right. Right. Mexico, right. and then if people can see that you don't know enough about that culture, but you're really trying right. to tell their yeah. story, even if you're not from there, yeah. that's compelling. Yeah. Because that's like a story within a story. Yeah. Because they, they find common grounds. They find yeah. common ground yeah, with the disconnect and the connection. Yes, all exactly. of it. Yeah. Because it's the human in us that we, we identify with. Yes. Yeah. Another thing that I brought you here about um, and it's incredibly inspiring, and I've had the opportunity to work with you uh, on this project, uh, and it's that you decided that you wanted to start a fashion, a luxury clothing brand, fashionable clothing brand, I think it's very fashionable, um, and I personally have never been one concerned with, with my image, however, be, since I've met you, 
I have uh, understood that there is something to fashion that goes beyond fashion that has probably to do with the same things that we're talking about here too, about like confidence, um, you know, uh, carrying yourself differently, you know, around people. There's right. something about it that draws people's attention. Uh, and if you are a beautiful person on the inside, you shine bright on the inside, with fashion, you can magnify that absolutely tenfold. Absolutely. You can multiply that yeah. aura. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Fashion. Is... So, 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 sorry. Yes. Yeah, so right. Start off with like. You can tell me about your opinions on what I said, but right. tell me about specifically about your clothing brand. Right. Tell me the name and and you know why do you pick that name right. where like give me some details as to uh, your your actual company i think before we do that like before i explain i'm just going to give you some products here i brought some products here for uh this is for, a, a, for wilson here i was not expecting but i'm very happy for oh yeah yeah he deserved yeah. way more than this it's just yeah. you know, a little gift from me uh um, thank you this is a box and of, of clothing inside and nice uh, yeah you feel free to so lapel me. de la vie yeah you can check them out on instagram lapel de la vie yes dot official dot official yes yeah. and also on the website lapel de la vie dot com Nice. So, uh, La Belle de la Vie is French for, because um, I just love the French language, so I pick French. Uh, yeah, nice. Uh, La Belle de la Vie means the call of life. Um, and the tag name is Fearless. So, the call of life is Fearless. So, I travel so much, you know, I encourage people just to be fearless, just go out there, chase your dream, and just... Uh, love that. Just, just do it, you know. Like, just go out there. Maybe I'm just borrowing Nike's slogan right now, but it just no, no. Go fearless. live life. Yeah, go live life. Go live life. Yeah, follow the call of your life. Right? right. Yeah, and you never know that what that call is until you expose yourself. You put yourself out there, and somehow, people, the environment around you, and you can say destiny will guide your hand. Um, just try things out, and you never, never know. You never know. Yeah. Go live life. Yeah. So, um, can can I can we open one? Of sure. Here sure. to kind of show. Sure. Maybe we can open this. Yeah. One. Open, open that one. Open yeah. this one. Are you yeah. Sure. Sure. All right. So let's open this. Okay. Uh -huh. So comes with a beautiful bow. Very nice, <laughs> elegant, sophisticated. Yeah, it took us a while. It looks very <laughs> luxurious. Yeah. Um, you open it. <laughs> there Amazing. You go. It comes with these like cards. So there's a there's yeah. A, tell me about this. Stuff. So there's a thank you card here, um, printed on premium paper. Okay. And um, nice. It's just basically thank you for supporting us and all that. And here we got the um, inside. The envelope would be in your some note written by me. Um, Let me take some pictures here real quick. <laughs> thank you. That's perfect. Beautiful. Yeah, and then you know, it's just some gifts I have inside. This is like stickers, you know, just for you to uh, stick on things, I guess. And he, we don't, I don't have a bill for him, so if you bought it from us, you know, there will be a bill <laughs> in here. Uh, but absolutely. So all these clothes are manufactured in Europe by you know some of the best. Um, yeah, put it up so there. you can kind of really see it. So it's like that. It's a little bit, a uh, little oversized. Um, uh, hoodie. It's heavy. It's heavy weight. Yeah, absolutely the best French terry um, uh, cotton out there. So we hand we hand picked the best of the best uh, cotton in the world and got a manufacturer in some of the best factory in the world. Uh, just that. Some tank top over here because I know he loves wearing tank top. Yeah, some tank. Do. Yeah, this will rock so so well in the summer and late spring. Um, I have a whole lot more for him, uh, but if you go on my website, you're gonna see it definitely. Here you go. Should we put this somewhere else? Yeah, we can put it on the ground here. Yeah. Okay. And this is just that because I travel so much, so this for you. Okay. Yeah. Just, just open that. Because the, the love, uh, I love traveling, so you know, I just I want to get into 
you know, manufacturing and making the best travel gear. Nice. Yes. Yeah, Beautiful. So, Perfect. You know. Yeah. Transition. And to and I right. use these on every of my trip. It's, I don't sell anything that I don't use. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, you did tell me about this. Yeah. So this is like a travel... Packing, compression packing cubes. There we go. So there are eight items in one set. Yeah, feel free to open up. And... Okay, so if you're traveling, you need these. Yes, uh, absolutely. He absolutely. let me borrow his when I traveled one time, and I fell in love with it. I didn't even realize I needed something like this until uh he got it for me yeah. but basically it has two zippers you put your your clothes in there and then you squeeze all of the air out and then once you tie it back up it literally it's an incredible product i, I spent so much time designing this and you know um and seeking advice from other people and this is like so each set this is a white set and I, I also have a black set. So this one is a, uh, what is it, a, a, a laundry bag for your dirty clothes when you travel. And this one is a shoe bag, you put your shoes in. I always keep my shoes in these bags, you know, so that I don't dirty them. And then you get a little toiletry bag. This is a beautiful bag, you know, wow. with room enough for your makeup, your whole toothbrushes go in there and your right. toothpaste and everything. Shampoo bottle go in there. That's and amazing. I specifically, you know, uh, ask my manufacturer to put zipper on everything just so keep everything in tight and it's water resistant so it won't stain your clothes nice yeah it's awesome like this you can put for ladies you can put your oh Bruce, oh, Bruce likes it yeah Bruce loves it uh, here you can put your I don't know ladies put your makeup brushes and stuff in here um, I don't have any makeup brushes see it's scratch uh, resistant as well <laughs> it's perfect yeah, and, and you know, I, I use this to put my uh, my my cord, like cable cords and you know, electrical cords uh, in here. Cat Bruce wants to see more. Show us more. Yeah, cards. absolutely. These are for your like underwear and tiny um, garments and whatever you know, like little tank tops you can put in here. Underwear, bikini, ladies, and in the back there's a there's a slot for a card to write what items you have inside. This almost reminds me of like one of those satchels that you can, like a fanny pack. Oh yeah. Can oh, you yeah. also maybe carry these around or? Oh, there, there's a handle. Right, so there's you a can, hand. right? Yeah. If you're traveling, maybe you can take something like Absolutely, here? you probably put your little bikini in here and bikini. walk to the beach and yeah, walk I'll to the lake. Yeah, I'll probably put my bikini in here. Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> man. I don't know. Will Wilson look great in bikini, guys? <laughs> And you know, and then you a polka dot bikini <laughs> exactly. And then you have these two large uh, uh, compartment. I mean, large cube. And so you inside. basically can, for the most part, uh, store some of these items even inside of a bigger bag and still compress all of it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you know, see these. These are just zipper to open them up, and then inside each of these cube, there's a. Uh, there's a clasp here and then you can you know kind of can you open it up a little oh, bit yeah, so oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay there gotcha so you can clasp it yeah and then everybody. clamp everything down uh, and to tighten it to tighten everything down and then, and then to flatten it yeah and then you push it down and then you can even so this one will give you some more room if you need more room see that yes it expands oh. to twice the size right yeah. Gotcha. Let me see real quick. Okay. Yes. So, so now it's can, twice the size. So it's twice the size, and then you and then, just yeah. And then once you have everything packed in, you can even pack it even tighter. Right. By pressing it down and zip it up. Right. So, so you use this already. Always travel. Always. Yeah. I've gotcha. tested these products out so many times on Got so it. many trips already. Got it. Um. So I've, it just helps to keep you everything condensed to travel light yes, and yes. have you know, more space for other things. Exactly. Okay. And the point of these is to to have you really think about what you should bring. Interesting. Because other other people without compression or without packing cubes, they just toss everything in the luggage. And because the luggage it looks like it's it's very roommate, so they just toss whatever they need and don't need in there. Right. But for these you need to be strategic, tactical, right. literally with your clothing and your packing. And it's awesome. I think it looks great. You open up your luggage. It looks amazing. It looks very fancy too. Yes. And like on, I like that you have the lapel de la vie. Yeah. Right there. Yes. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah. The lapel de la vie here. Literally everything on there was was thought out by me and my team, and it took a long time. Um, every little thing, the zipper, the handle that we you know selected. Look at this, like per look at this. Like, yeah, everything we designed. Every little letter is we we designed. Yes. I love that. Is that like a logo? Is that, <laughs> is that, that was our first attempt of of, of playing with a logo. Yeah, gotcha. uh, but that's just something for fun. Yes. Okay, so lapeldelavie.com if you want to check out more. Lapel de la vie. Um, Instagram. Um, I'm a photographer. Yeah. And I have uh, helped Andy. Uh, you know, do some uh, photography uh, for his branding, yeah. and it was amazing. We had some uh, actors that we brought in, and uh, we took some great photos, and you can check those out right now on the Instagram and on the website, too. Yeah, on the website, too, at lapellelovey.com. Um, so you can check that out. You can check out Intuitive right. Pixels, which is my um, <laughs> photography page that I use mostly for my clients. Um, and uh, you can see some photos there too, but uh, yeah. yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. This no, is a great you. I'm and definitely Wilson, gonna use yeah. it. Yeah, Wilson is an incredible photographer. I mean, he doesn't show it, he doesn't talk about it much, but uh, it, it was fascinating to, to be working with him um, in the two sessions that we had. It's just the way he, he structured the whole photo shoot, uh, the way he planned the whole thing, and the way he worked with the, uh, with the talents that we had. Um, and he's a quick learner too. From shoot one to shoot two, it's just a vast difference. Such an improvement. Like like I I've told you this many many times. Yeah. And I'm I'm willing and I'm happy to refer you to anybody I know. I mean, you would do good work, um, not just in photography, but I guess, uh, but I think in in anything else as well. But just the way you handle your life and. Thank you. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's awesome. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um. So yeah. So I mean. This guy thought of everything. There's these little like cards that you can write information on, so you can put it on the baggies in case you lose the bag. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. You've really put a lot of thought into it, and uh, I admire the heck out of everything that you're doing. Um, so I guess that's a good place to kind of stop. I just want to thank uh, Sir Andy again for stopping by. He's my first guest on the podcast, First Talk Podcast. Um, where there's probably going to be many, many more. So stay tuned for that. Andy, Sir Andy, Andy, Sir Andy. Uh, no, thank you so much. You know, like, it, how does it actually go? Like, oh, just very soft. Yeah, soft. very soft and bow. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Seriously, I really do. Appreciate no, no, it. thank you. I appreciate your time and um, having me on. And this is such an honor. Um, this is one of the first few podcasts I've ever done in my life. So uh, I hope, you know, we share something useful and informative. Um, hopefully I'll, I'll be back and oh for sure <laughs> oh yeah